गणपति गुंहवामहे कविं कवीनामुपमश्रवस्तम ज्येष्ठराज ब्रह्मण ब्रह्मणस्पत आन शृण्वन्नोति सेदसादन प्रणो दिवे सरस्वतीवाजेर्वाजिनी धीनामित्रयवत गणेशा नम सरस्वत नम श्रीगुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओ श्री साईरा लविंग साईरा एंड ग्रीटिंग्स फ्रॉम द श्री सत्य साई नेशनल लीडरशिप प्रोग्राम फॉर सेल्फ ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन दिस इवनिंग वी हैव Dr. Amit Deshpande from the Sri Satyasai Center for Human Values with us. Dr. Amit Deshpande he is from Maharashtra and was a student of the Sri Satyasai Primary School, Prashanti Nilayam, from 1990 to 1993. He acquired his bachelor's degree in commerce from Bangalore University. He then pursued chartered accountancy. He has worked briefly with the Hewlett Packard in their financial service center at Bangalore. During this time, he was a member of the Brindavan Bhajan Group and also a Brindavan Sevadhan. In 2003, he enrolled for the MBA Finance Program at the Sri Satyasai Institute of Higher Learning. Thereafter, at Bhagwan's behest, he registered for the MPhil Program in 2006 and was awarded the gold medal in 2007 for distinction in MPhil. He completed his doctoral studies in 2016 in the area of corporate strategy from the Department of Management and Commerce, Prashanti Nilay. During this period, he also taught the students in India program subjects including strategic management, corporate financial strategy, management control systems, and the awareness program. He deems it a privilege to be a member of the Prashanti Bhajan Group. In 2017, the Sri Satyasai Center for Human Values was established in Prashanti Nilayam under the auspices of the Sri Satyasai Center Trust. It has been mandated to carry out research and training in the teachings of Bhagwan Baba. Dr. Ame works there as a resident fellow. He is now involved in developing and conducting training programs in the Swami teachings, including journals for professionals and organization of his bearers. The CHV is involved in research and conduct training programs, courses, workshops, exhibitions. He has also participated in various radio sites, now known as Sri Satyasai Media Center, such as programs, and regularly speaks in various forums nationally and internationally for the organization members. We are indeed fortunate to have Dr. Ami with us today to summarize Dhyana Vahini chapters 5 to 9. We welcome Brother Amit Deshpande to come and enlighten us on the topic. Sai Ram, Brother. Let us begin with the chanting of Sai Gayatri. <coughs> oh, Sai Shwaraya Vidmahe. सत्य सत्यदेवाय धीम तर्व प्रचोदया शाति 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 ऑफरिंग आर collective pranams at the divine lotus feet of our ever present swami and invoking his grace and his presence this evening a loving sairam to all of you all the participants of the national leadership program i hope that you've been enjoying this program and i'm very glad to join you all for this uh, evening session on dhyana vahini what we will try to do in the next 1 hour or so is i will present to you my summary of the five chapters from chapter 5 to chapter 9 once again i want to emphasize on my summary because 
Swami's literature is like that. Every one of us, each and every one of us, when we read it, a different point actually kind of touches us. We may be impressed or, uh, you know, influenced by a different point. So what I will try to do is I will present to you my understanding of the Dhyana Vahini and I'll leave it to you to take it forward to contemplate higher and deeper on what you have read. Now, at the outset, I must tell you that, um, you know, my, my commendations to all of you, my congratulations to all of you, because Dhyana Vahini is a pretty tough Vahini. And right up front <laughs> for, uh, you know, to take up the study of Dhyana Vahini uh, can be a, a, a pretty onerous task. So my congratulations to you. If you have, if you have successfully uh, survived uh, up to chapter nine, then I can also assure you that the rest of the chapters are pretty easy. Right. Um, so probably, so what we will do is I will present, um, you know, the points and then let's open it out for some kind of discussion in case you have any doubts, you have any uh, comments or you have any questions that you may have. We can take that up, uh, you know, in, in this session. Uh, does that fine? Uh, does that sound fine? Is that, is that an okay format to have? All right. Yes, yes, yes sir. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so let's let's yes. start. Um, yes. At the outset, I want to actually jump to chapter number eight, and the very first line of chapter number eight, Swami makes a beautiful point. Swami says that in this mundane world, if you consider that the mundane world is different from the spiritual world, then you are making a mistake. In fact, the whole idea of the spiritual world is that it helps you to do well in the mundane world also. While that is not the goal of it, right? The whole purpose of the spiritual, uh, uh, you know, the world or the spiritual progress is that you become adept, you become uh, proficient in all aspects of your life, right? And for that sake, it's very important. What is important? is to you know make uh, make strides take good strides in the spiritual life and for that meditation is very important in fact he uses the word ekagrata one pointedness right and so if you look at the entire dhyana vahini you will find this one word ekagrata one pointedness coming again and again and again right so uh, keep that in mind when we are doing this discussion is that the whole purpose of meditation is to keep coming back to this one-pointedness. So having said this, um, you know, this, this outside world and the inner world, the temporal world that we see is, can be compared to the outside world and the spiritual world is the inner world. So let me very quickly share an experience with you so that, you know, it kind of becomes light before we kind of uh, dive deep into this really uh, difficult, uh, you know, few chapters. While I say they are difficult, I would say that these five chapters, if you kind of get a grip on, you don't need to read any other spiritual literature. I can tell you that very, uh, you know, uh, I can emphasize on that to no end. Okay. If you have understood, if you get a decent grip, and that is what we will try to do, uh, we will try to get, get a crash course on these five chapters. If you have understood these five chapters, believe me, it contains, you know, the, the what should I say, the uh, nichod in Hindi. It's the, it's the essence of all the world scriptures are literally there in these five chapters. It is enough. You don't have to read the rest of Dhyana Vahini, uh, you know, and I can even tell you that. However, as a part of your course, you should read Dhyana Vahini, okay? Don't, don't uh, quote me later on saying that, uh, you know, Brother Ame said that no need to read and so I'm not reading. The idea is that if you get a hang of these five chapters, believe me, nothing else is required. So let me start with an experience. Uh, th this was this happened during the time when I was uh, a bhajan singer in Brindavan. Uh, and so in those years, uh, you know, whenever Swami would come to Brindavan, which is Whitefield near in Bangalore, uh, we would get an opportunity to sing bhajans in front of Swami. And uh, so we would be sitting, uh, for those of you who have seen Brindavan, you will realize what I'm saying. But for those of you who have not seen Brindavan, there is a stage 
okay and right below the stage swami sits on the stage it's a pretty high stage almost like 6 feet you know high and below that we sit now what used to happen is in the evenings when swami would come for bhajans he would come on to the stage and right up to the time that he would come near his chair i couldn't see him you know the all of us who were seated in the first row we couldn't see it because the stage was so high so only after swami comes to you know to the throne that is when we would be able to see him now i used to you know kind of uh, feel a little uh, though we were sitting in the first row it was uh, it was a, in a, it was an ironical place to sit because for a decent amount of time like you know 10 15 minutes you won't not sorry not 10 15 minutes i, I should say 2 to 3 minutes we will not see swami at all we have to literally look at somebody else's faces and figure out where swami could be right so the bhajan had started and swami you know the the moment the door would open how we would know is that everybody's hands would go like this right so the moment the door opens and swami emerges everybody's hands go like this so that is how we know where swami is so i saw uh, i noticed that all the hands had gone into this namaskar position and after that what i did was i closed my eyes and i started to visualize the swami who you know in my mind's eye swami actually walking to the throne i couldn't see swami right so i'm visualizing swami walking to the stage and uh, i was enjoying that visualization right and in my uh, in my mind's eye the moment i thought that swami is near the throne i opened my eyes and i looked up at the throne right and exactly exactly the way swami was in my visualization exactly like that swami was really standing there and he was looking straight into my eyes and he just uh, you know and he very quickly uh, you know made a give me give me a smile and then he took his position on the throne that this particular incident it's a, a pretty innocuous one for many of you but it made such a deep impact on me to tell me that in fact it is the inner swami that whom we have forgotten and that is why an external swami has to come to reintroduce to us the swami that we have forgotten in in our minds right the whole purpose of national leadership program bhajans and seva and all of the so called spiritual activities that we do is only to realize the swami who is seated in our hearts and because we have forgotten the swami who is seated in our hearts an external swami has to come to introduce to us that hey you know what i am actually seated in your heart right the whole idea of dhyana the whole idea of meditation is to be focused on the swami who is seated in our hearts and so now the question that you may ask is wo 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 hang on if i'm going to be focused on the swami seated in my heart how am i going to go about doing all the multifarious activities that I, I, that i have to do uh, starting from early morning to doing my work to doing my household chores you know to you know uh, uh, fulfilling all the responsibilities that i have how am i supposed to do all of that if i'm going to be constantly focused and that is exactly what we are going to discuss swami answers those questions in fact the point that i took first from the 8th chapter is exactly this right if you go back to the 8th chapter and right in the beginning swami says it is not correct to say that the qualities and attainments needed for temporal progress is different from the ones which are required for spiritual progress right so even if you want to progress or you want to succeed in this material world the tools and techniques that are necessary to succeed in this material world are the same tools and techniques that are necessary for the spiritual world right and what is that one single technique that one single technique is one pointedness ekagrata right in fact um, there is a very famous book that has been written by uh, daniel goldman daniel goldman is the one who gave us this topic called emotional quotient right we all have heard of iq intelligence quotient right i'm sure you have also heard of eq a lot of companies 
you know are uh, are talking about eq and now of course the latest buzzword is what is called sq right which is spiritual quotient now this word eq was given by daniel goldman right in his very famous book in the 1980s the same daniel goldman about a decade ago wrote his second book not his second book uh, another book which became equally fa uh, famous and the you know what is the title of the book the title of the book is called focus he said that having studied a number of successful people you know across his lifetime right whether they are successful in science they are successful in sports they are successful in politics they are successful in business they are successful in any field of you know a human activity the one thing that um, that differentiates them from everybody else is this one quality of focus right and this is exactly the point that swami is making this focus is nothing but ekagrata one pointedness okay so that is the first point and this this point will keep coming again and again and again so having said this uh we we'll, let's go to the next point and that is again from the chapter 8 itself swami says that this ekagrata you see the mind is like you know the mind is like a house fly or swami in fact compares it to a horse right the the mind always keeps running if you if you actually for those of you who have seen a horse uh and if you have not you know try to go to some zoo or somewhere you know uh, go and see a horse just notice the horse you will notice you know why the mind is compared to the horse because a horse can just not stand steadily you will notice that the, all the time something in the body of the horse will keep moving either it will be its tail or it will be its ears you know or some part of the skin which will be twitching you see all the time it is this restlessness is there in the horse and that is why the mind is compared often to the horse of course it is compared to a monkey you know it is compared to a house fly it's compared to all sorts of animals in fact those animals must be wondering what wrong did we do you are not able to control your mind and so now you are blaming us for it right but swami in fact compares it to a horse so this this property of the mind you know to all the time keep jumping from one point to the other for example right now right now i am sure your mind is on a on a multiple things if not entirely i mean if not too many things definitely one of one part of your mind is on the time okay uh, how much more time is left for this okay uh, what about my dinner okay what is cooking for dinner am i going to get something from swiggy or from zomato right so all of this is running and then oh my god this brother you know i hope he finishes on time because i have so many other things to do you see the mind is constantly and you know what today they talk it they they talk about it called multitasking right uh, and they say that it's very good if you are a good multitasker in fact the book focus right by daniel goldman says that multitasking is another name for failure in fact nobody can ever multitask at one point of time you can do only one thing right so keep that in mind so this myth of multitasking and you can read it all over the uh, internet there are so many articles on how multitasking is actually a myth right now this multitasking or this mind jumping on several thoughts swami gives it the name anekagrata okay uh that is many pointedness in the english version in the chapter 8 swami calls it calls it many pointedness okay so instead of having ekagrata our mind has anekagrata this is the problem with our mind so either the mind has anekagrata which is on one side or it has shunyata which is no pointedness you see for example tonight when you go to bed right and hopefully you will all go to bed on time and you will you know kind of you will go into deep sleep there will be at least 1 to 2 hours wherein you will have idea of nothing right remember this deep sleep is also a beautiful state to be in you know why because you you have to give up every single thing in order to go and get into deep sleep right for example even the fact that you are so and so for example 
as long as i remember that i am ame deshpande i cannot sleep right imagine if i keep saying i am ame deshpande i am ame deshpande ame deshpande should sleep ame i should sleep ame i should sleep you know what we will never sleep right you have to even give up this label called ame deshpande to actually go into deep sleep correct in deep sleep there is absolutely nothing it's a blankness and that is what is called no pointedness which is shunyata right so the one avastha one state is the shunya avastha the other state on the other side is anekagrata right now this mind either it stays it moves towards shunyata that is zero pointedness or it moves towards anekagrata which is many pointedness now swami says that this no pointedness no is tamas is tamasic okay it is a it is a dull quality you see for example sleep no is a dull is a, is a dullness of the mind so do not mistake sleep otherwise somebody will say hey you know what instead of meditating why not i sleep you see there is a very little difference between meditation and sleep right we in fact even i am not sure whether we did discuss this in uh, you know in the orientation program when you all had come to prashanti but there is only one difference between meditation and sleep you know what is that that is alertness in in sleep we have no alertness that's right somebody has written awareness but awareness the another word for awareness is alertness to be alert right to be uh, to be focused and to be one pointed right so in deep sleep what happens we become no pointed and in uh, in our wakeful state we become many pointed many pointedness is rajasic quality no pointedness is tamasic quality swami saying that one pointedness is satvic quality right so for our mind to remain satvic the only way is by aneka the, by ekagrata by one pointedness right so keep this in mind believe me we have not even come to the spiritual aspect huh? just remember one thing to be successful in any field that you may be in ekagrata is absolutely necessary okay so having understood this now let us take up uh chapter 5 and 6 and 7 extremely beautiful chapters right swami starts um you know the chapter 5 uh by saying that there are certain qualifications that are necessary in order to um you know to go, to walk on the spiritual path right this is very very important for those of you who are serious seekers of you know of spirituality these are the four major qualifications that you require okay what are they swami talks about it um okay somebody is mentioning but usually women do multitasking at home you know what even when you are doing multitasking remember that at any one given time no you are focused on only that thing and if you are not focused on that thing for example when, let us say when you are cooking at home right imagine if your mind kind of wanders to something else you will end up goofing up in your cooking right something will be more or something will be less in fact especially mothers you will notice that you may be doing a 100 chores at home but the one pointedness will be always on what the child is doing especially if it's a baby the mother is absolutely focused on the baby right the baby may be in another room the baby may be deep in sleep but even if the baby moves the mother knows because the absolute focus is on the baby while you know while she is doing a lot of things so swami is not saying do only you know do only one thing <laughs> swami is saying focus the focus must be on what is important and you see this is what we will take up again and again okay so a lot of people say you know for example that is what we discuss oh how am i supposed to focus on god when i have so many other that is the whole idea of meditation right the whole purpose and the whole objective of meditation is can i keep my mind on my goal while i am doing many many things you know for those of all the my brothers out there who are sports enthusiasts i am a huge sports enthusiast okay you will all the time see people like virat kohli there are people like ms dhoni people like sachin tendulkar or even people like roger federer right all of them talk again and again and again they will only talk on one thing you know what they will talk on they'll talk on process says if if our mind is going to be on the scoreboard we will never be able to play 
i have to remain focused on what i have to do right at that moment i have to play that point if i say okay two games from now what i'm supposed to do i will lose it right so you will see this happening you, uh, constantly in any field people who are absolutely on top of the field right they'll talk about this right so coming back to the qualifications what are the qualifications now we are going to enter slightly deeper into spirituality okay even before we enter let me say one thing so if you say that okay thank you brother uh, yeah a uh, meditation is very useful for me to become successful in my day to day life why do i need spirituality right i don't, i just want to be successful in my day to day life all of you are going to become leaders of tomorrow right you are in the national leadership program you will become national and international leaders so why do i need spirituality for this right that is the question now the only difference between worldly success and spiritual success is this worldly success no is taking the mind outwards okay and spiritual success is about taking the mind inwards okay that is the only difference you see bahya drishti and antar drishti a spiritual life takes you inwards a uh, 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 material life will take you outward the same one pointedness the same ekagrata helps you to get success in both external world as well as internal world swami in fact goes on to say the problem with the in fact okay let's let's take that uh, in chapter number 6 right this is exactly the thing that swami presents swami says the problem with the external world is that it is transient right it is anityam you see uh lord krishna in bhagavad gita no he says that there are two properties of this world in fact this entire material world no is like a gated community okay just consider this is my uh, my, my analogy okay you all live in some kind of apartments right you each of your apartments may have some name right it has some prestige something something or some you know whatever i don't know what what, what are the names of your apartments but you know there is a name for this entire world and it is also a gated community and the name of this world is anityam asukham loke there is a board okay when you are before entering into this the board says anityam asukham loke apartments okay or anityam asukham loke uh, gated community okay the name of this world is anityam and asukham what is anityam impermanent nitya means permanence anitya means impermanent transient ephemeral it is momentary right if you look at you know everything in your life just uh, just see right everything keeps changing your mind changes the most you were thinking something let's say one hour back now you are thinking something else you know one hour later you will be thinking something else right look at the world itself constantly changing right yesterday there was some problem today there is some problem tomorrow there is some problem right so this world the property of this world is that it is anityam and because it is anityam it becomes asukham asukham meaning there is no pleasure there is no lasting happiness because constantly what was giving me happiness now doesn't give me happiness right look at your own uh, experience in day to day life you you buy a new dress all the sisters out there right you buy a new dress or you buy a new sari on the first day that sari is the most amazing acquisition that you have what happens uh, about uh, you know five six times after you know you wear it now that same sari doesn't give you as much happiness as it gave you on the very first day correct okay coming to brothers <clears throat> or any electronic gadget that we have okay the latest iphone right you see how how each of these electronic gadgets you just see how they market the whole idea is to make you dissatisfied with what you already have that is why a new model comes isn't it whether a new car or a new phone or a new smart watch or whatever you have the whole idea is to massage your dissatisfaction right only if you remain dissatisfied will their products be sold right so the whole idea of marketing is to create a dissatisfaction in you asukam asukam is nothing but dissatisfaction you see so the whole world is <clears throat> dependent on this anityam asukam loke 
you see in this anityam asukham loke what are we searching for we are searching for nityam sukham we want permanent happiness how are we going to get it right the whole premise where we are searching for itself is a wrong place in an anityam asukham loke how are we going to find permanent happiness see this is the problem with success in the in the transient world or the material world however spiritual success is permanent right once it comes it it only grows it never leaves hence it's always better to get spiritual success rather than so that is this is exactly what a swami talks about in chapter number 6 he says that each of our lives you know is so transient the people in our lives are so transient every relationship is transient right we all remember how much we loved our parents when we were small right <clears throat> till the age of 6 7 probably 10 not a day could go without conversing with mother what happens to the same mother 10 years later right when we have jobs when we go to college we suddenly have different friends the same mother now probably doesn't become as important as my friends in fact it happens more so with fathers where the child suddenly feels that hey the father doesn't know anything right are yaar papa you, you know your 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 ideas are all age old right aap kaun si duniya mein reh rahe hain in which generation are you living we say that you see all relations keep changing hence it's important to get that spiritual success which is permanent success that is what swami talks about in chapter number 6 in fact uh, the chapter number 6 the ending of chapter number 6 is absolutely beautiful if you have not read uh, you know chapter number 6 at least do read the last part of uh, chapter number 6 and in case you have not then i will read it out to you here <clears throat> swami says all living beings are actors on the stage of life right he says this entire world is like a stage and we are all actors right they take their exit when the curtain falls and when their part is over you see everybody in our life at some point of time will enter at some point of time they will exit right our grandparents they were there at some point of time and now they are not not there they have exited the stage right maybe tomorrow when we get married and we have children the child will enter into the stage and one day from his stage we will exit you see it's a very beautiful analogy which makes everything so clear right on that stage one may play the part of a thief another may be cast as a king a third may be a clown and another a beggar for all these characters in the play there is one who gives the cue he is the director he is the script writer right he is the producer so production direction script writing lyricist music everything is provided by one lord right now here you have to remember one thing what is it that that lord no he will not always come you see sometimes like we are so lucky that the producer and director himself becomes an actor on the stage and comes in the form of bhagwan shri satyasai baba but that does not happen often right avatars like lord krishna and ramachandra and jesus right they don't come often they only come when the plot of the movie is going so terribly wrong that unless they come onto the stage it will not improve <clears throat> right but you what do they do they stay in our hearts they speak to us through our conscience right and so swami goes on to say that that one that director he stands behind okay and he keeps giving us these cues hey you have forgotten your dialogue hey you have you are not acting properly hey you are doing some other role you are not you are not supposed to do that role you are supposed to do this role right so be it dialogue or speech or song okay the lord is behind the screen on the stage of this creation giving cue to all actors for their various parts so each actor must be conscious of his presence behind the screen of illusion that is this world each must be anxious anxious meaning we must we must be all the time alert okay though actually i think the word should be alert over here to catch the faintest suggestion means even if the slightest thing that swami wants us to do we should be able to catch it you see that is alertness 
that is what we get through dhyana okay instead if the person forgets the plot and the story then he becomes you know a laughing stock now the last line very very important in fact um all of dhyana no is just covered in this one last line you see what he says the attention you see what did we say alertness awareness attention must be on both what is that it must be on the lines one has learned and on the stage manager's directions if we have actually learned the lines properly no the stage manager manager won't even direct us because we are doing it properly it is only when we have not learned it properly then the stage manager has to keep giving directions right so the attention must be on doing our duty as an actor okay and also so that is why atmano mokshartam jagat hitaya cha right it is always getting your uh, you know the your self realization and being of benefit to the world and and once again doesn't mean that these are two different activities they are the same activity it just one complements the other and then swami says meditation alone gives this concentration and this awareness in fact with this one line we can wrap up this discussion on dhyana vahini because so beautiful this entire paragraph this entire analogy of the drama actor no dear brothers and sisters my humble suggestion to you would be try it out over the next one week no act as if like from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you sleep no just think that you are an actor okay and everybody is acting their own roles okay so it could be for example if you are stuck in traffic or you are you know you are crammed in one crowded bus or a train right just think that everybody in the train is actually an actor okay you go to office your boss is an actor your colleagues are actors you come back home your mom is an actor okay your dad is an actor your child is an actor your husband or wife is an actor just see the entire perspective you know what happens a gap is actually you know inserted between you the original and you the actor and the rest of the world okay a beautiful gap will be actually installed there and you will start enjoying so just imagine if somebody starts yelling at you no you know you know what will be your uh, what will be your reaction ah amazing yeah amazingly is yelling yeah amazing superb acting right if somebody imagine somebody screws up uh, let's say you know the food you wanted something and somebody does not make the food properly what will be your reaction ah today he has not acted his role properly that is why the food is not good if he would have acted his role properly the food would have been good no problem tomorrow i have to remind him that his or god will remind him that stage manager will remind him of his you know of his role you see this one um, one analogy will constantly help you to be focused right to be focused on the fact that you are nothing but an actor and everybody else this entire world is a stage okay now this itself brings us to chapter number 5 okay if you have understood this much that this entire world is a is a stage then you have already ticked the first qualification and what is that the first qualification is viveka right viveka is nothing but discernment or discrimination between what is transient and what is permanent what is untruth and what is truth what is darkness and what is light right the very fact that we know that we are merely actors on this on the stage called the world it means that this drama is going to end at some point of time but i am something more than the drama i am something beyond that the role that i am playing this itself is viveka okay the first qualification that is necessary on the spiritual field right once you have understood once we understand that oh this is impermanent and this is permanent or this transit you know this world is impermanent and god is permanent you know what happens automatically the second qualification comes which is vairagya vairagya is an automatic detachment from what is impermanent okay it simply means that oh for example 
um, you know, when we were little, when we were small, we had small, small toys, right? If you remember, we had, we will have a, we will have a car, a small car, or we will have all the sisters out there would have had some Barbie dolls, right? Today, do you have those dolls with you? No, right? Probably not. If, if somebody is having a doll, uh, probably, you know, some, probably something is wrong. You still, no, and I don't, I won't say it's wrong, but like you're very deeply attached with that Barbie doll. But today, you know, uh, we don't, we are not attached to those dolls. Why? Can we say that we are actually Vairagya? Have we, have we uh, got Vairagya from the doll? Right? Why? Because it's, it, yeah, it used to be, it used to help me at that time. Now it does not help me. Right? This is the kind, this is actually Vairagya. It is that, uh, you know, it is that effortless detachment that we get towards something that is not important. Right? It is an effortless detach. It's not something that, oh my God, I have to be detached from the world. Oh, I have to detach myself from family. It's an automatic effortless detachment that comes because we realize that, oh, everybody is just an actor, man. And this drama is going to get, end at some point of time. Right? So that is the second qualification. The third uh, qualification is what is called Shat Sampati. Now, Shat Sampati itself has got six, uh, you know, kind of subsets of that. Okay, what are the subsets for those of you who have who have some basic idea of uh, of Vedanta? The Shat Sampati are Sama, Dhamma, Uparati, Titiksha, uh, Samadhana, and Shraddha. Right? These are the six. Uh, Swami has actually not mentioned this in chapter number five. So this is. Uh, my extra footnote <laughs> to the six qualifications. Swami simply talks about Viveka, Vairagya and the six fold. Uh, maybe let's just read that part. Let me just go to chapter number five. What does Swami say? Just one second. Yeah. So Swami says, each of the students have to have certain primary qualifications. What are they? Discrimination, Viveka, renunciation, Vairagya and the six qualities that constitute a good character, right? So the six qualities are Shama, Tama, Titiksha, Uparati, Samadhana, and Shraddha. Okay. Now, what are they? Very quickly, in fact, an entire session can happen just on these six qualities because they are so they are so critical for a spiritual aspirant. Sama and Dhamma are internal and external control of senses, right? External control of senses and internal control of senses. Right? Shama and Dhamma. Let's not get too much into it. Uh, then the next two, Uparati and Titiksha. Titiksha refers to what is called spiritual fortitude. Right? For example, um, nothing stops you from doing, you know, from getting your goal. Right? In fact, you will notice that to get success in anything in the world, you need some amount of Titiksha. Okay. For example, let's say you have an important deadline coming up or for all the students out there, you have an examination coming up or an assignment to submit. What happens? You give up, you know, everything, right? It is, ah, okay. The word is Shama, not Shama, Shama. Okay. That is S-A-M-A, S-H-A-M-A. -A. Okay. Shama, Dhamma, right? Internal and external control, right? Titiksha is Basically, spiritual fortitude, that is not giving up, having that uh, determination, having that dedication to spirituality, especially to spirituality. Right? Otherwise, usually what happens to us, uh, you know, the tendency is, I'm sure this must, be, must have happened to most of you. On Jan 1st, I think this also we had discussed in the uh, orientation, right? That on Jan 1st, we take a resolution, okay? And there are all the resolutions are fantastic resolutions, right? Uh, that I want to meditate or I want to pray more or I want to do bhajans or, you know, whatever. I want to read more books or I want to exercise more. I want to control my sweets, etc., etc. Now, the determination that helps you to stay on that path, come what may, that is titiksha. Okay. So this is a very important qualification. If you don't have titiksha, what happens? No habit remains a habit, right? No good uh, kind of activity remains a habit because it is given up very fast. We kind of, you know, get bored of it. Are yaar, how much more namasmarana to do? Oh, how much more meditation to do? Right? Why should I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning? Etc. Etc. So, Titiksha. 
Next is what is called Uparati. Uparati is a beautiful uh, word. Uparati is a kind of uh, effortless detachment towards the world. It's a, it's a, a bit like Vairagya only, but like, you know, the Uparati that, uh, that we spoke about, for example, um, uh, what, what example can I give you? Uh, as a small child, you know, you loved, uh, you loved something. Let us say you loved cake, right? Now, uh, you know, you, you, you grow up and you come to know that you go for your blood tests and the doctor tells you that, hey man, I think your sugar is on the limit. Okay. And you need to give up sweets, right? Now what happens? You come back home and you very effortlessly, for, and in case you have not done it, please ask those who have actually given up sweet. You know, that day, the day they come to know that they are borderline diabetes or they are diabetic, you know, they simply give up all sweets. You know how? Because their life is more important to them than eating sweets. So till now, sweets was very important for me. But now my life is more important than sweets. And so automatically I get a detachment towards sweets. Right? This is called Uparati. So a kind of detachment from the world. Uh, you know, kind of, you know what, enough. Bas ho gaya. I've enjoyed my bit in the world. I don't need the world now. That is Uparati. Unless you have that, you know, for a spiritual aspirant, very difficult to walk on the spiritual path. Right? Then you have Samadhana. Samadhana is kind of a satisfaction. Right? A, a, a spiritual satisfaction that comes out of Uparati. Okay? And the, the, the final one is Shraddha. Shraddha refers to faith. Now, you may say that, hey, you're just asking me to have blind faith? No. The so Shraddha that we mention over here is what is called as a working faith. Okay? Working faith meaning, for example, when you take up your textbook or when you open a newspaper, what happens? Just, you know, you take up a newspaper or you read Google News or I don't know, wherever you get your news from, you have a basic working faith that what that person or what that newspaper is saying is true. Right? It's a working faith. It's not that you don't, or let's say, especially textbooks, you know, back in the day when we were studying whatever, engineering or medicine or commerce, right? We didn't open a textbook saying that, you know, this author is a liar. This author knows nothing, right? We open the textbook knowing that, you know what, this author knows what he's talking about. That is the working faith that we are talking about. So similarly, faith in the Lord, faith in the Lord's message, Faith in our scriptures, a working faith in our scriptures is necessary for any spiritual aspirant. Right? So this is what the chapter number 5 talks about. So, uh, you know, and um, this is absolutely, a, you know, uh, uh, the basic qualification, Viveka, Vairagya, Shant Sampati, and the fourth one that Swami does not mention here is called Mumukshatvam, which is called Intense Desire for Liberation. Unless you have these, you cannot be a spiritual aspirant. Now, let's come to the last few points of, uh, you know, these four chapters. Mind you, I have, I have kind of really packed in, summarized uh, all of it in, in this short time. But probably the most important thing that Swami repeats again and again through these five chapters is contemplation, meditation, and chanting of the Lord's name, that is Japa, right? Uh, and the Swami speaks so beautifully, so beautifully on why is the name of the Lord uh, so important, right? So Swami talks about it in uh, in chapter number seven, and in chapter number uh, yeah, predominantly chapter number seven. Swami talks about why the name of the Lord is so important. In fact. He says why Namasvarana itself is the highest sadhana and a prerequisite for good meditation. You see, once again, one-pointedness is good. But how do I convert this outside-going mind to an inward-going mind? It is through Namasvarana, through tranching, uh, chanting the Lord's name. Now Swami makes a, a, you know, a, a beautiful points regarding why Namasvarana is so important. Swami says that, Amongst all other sadhanas, whether it is yoga, whether it is, it, it is yajna, whether it is um, uh, yaga, okay, all other uh, uh, 
there are some there are some basic problems in these sadhanas okay the pro the problems are, are that if you don't do it properly you know you will not get any benefit out of it for example if you don't do yajna properly you don't get the benefit out of it if you don't do yoga properly uh, you won't get any benefit out of it okay one of the questions is what is the difference between japa and namaskarana there is no difference between japa and namaskarana it is the same okay they are just two different terms um so coming back to coming back to this uh, point while all other spiritual sadhanas have some pitfalls namaskarana has no pitfall at all you see you know when you buy something or especially when these people do marketing they will tell you 50% discount you know grab this offer today a limited uh, you know uh, whatever whatever and then there will be one star okay and then the star no when you actually read it there will be a whole lot of conditions apply correct they won't show you the conditions they will simply say 50% discount grab this never before offer etc etc you see all other spiritual sadhanas no have they are also like that do yoga this 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 will happen okay but actually there will be one small star conditions apply what are the conditions you should do this you should do this you should do this only if you do this then only you will have <laughs> Uh, you know uh, the, the the spiritual sadhana will, will work you know uh, for namaskarana there is no conditions apply chanting the name of the lord absolutely no conditions apply swami in fact tells you that you don't even have to worry about any kind of formalities any kind of preparation find a place find a name and simply start chanting right uh, so the second thing that swami talks about the beauty of namaskarana is uh, okay so i think there are some there are some questions coming up uh, i think the question is what is samadhana samadhana is a satisfaction okay a, a kind of steadiness that one has with wherever you are you know in your uh, you know this, this the same concept of ekagrata in a slightly different way right the we you remember during uh, during the orientation we talked about what is self satisfaction self satisfaction is nothing but samadhan to be steady okay to be satisfied with where you are okay because that is very important for you to take the strides that is basically get yourself um, you know what should i say grounded in where you are currently from there only you can jump right and mumukshatvam that's right an intense desire you know for moksha moksha is liberation and mumuksha is intensity of that uh, desire for liberation coming back to namaskarana uh, the beauty of the chanting of the name of the lord is it is universal okay every religion every single religion in the world you know the rituals may be different the customs may be different the traditions may be different but one thing that is common in all religions is chanting the name of the lord Right? that is what makes it absolutely universal okay well, well, now how i should chant the name where i should chant the name that may differ but chanting remains the same that's another beautiful thing that swami talks about in chapter number 7 the third swami says between the form and the name between form and the name okay the one of the questions that has come is please tell us about contemplation contemplation is um is a you know is a stage between concentration and meditation it's just an intermediate stage see concentration is for example to concentrate on a particular thing but when i do it with interest no for example i can concentrate on cooking okay for example i am not a good cook okay i i, I don't know how co how to cook but if i have to cook you know for my survival i will cook and when i am cooking i will have concentration but you know what i won't have contemplation on it because i'm not interested in it but the moment you have little more interest in it no then that concentration converts into contemplation and a deeper contemplation on that results in meditation so contemplation is an intermediate a kind of a you know a, a stage between concentration and meditation right so swami talks about why is the name so beautiful in fact even more than the form of the lord the name of the lord is more powerful and swami gives two beautiful examples over here the example that swami gives is that of a rose and that of a mango for example right now close your eyes and think of a rose 
So let's do that for the next five seconds. Think of the most beautiful rose that you have ever seen. Okay. Is it in front of your eyes? Okay. Now describe to yourself the rose. What color, you know, is the rose? What is the fragrance which is emanating from the rose? Are there dew drops on the rose? So on, so forth. Okay. Now Swami says, just by saying the name of rose, you got a beautiful, fully blossomed rose of various colors which you like. Right? Maybe red or yellow or pink or white. However, when you go to a market and actually buy a rose, you know, you know what you focus on? You focus on all the negativities of the rose. That is, you'll first, when you when you pick up the rose, you'll see whether, you know, is it blossomed fully or not? Are the petals dried or not? Are they black or not? Okay. Are the thorns removed or not? Right? You see, before you buy a rose, you actually start examining the rose. So, this is the difference between the name and the form. The form is always examined. The name is always enjoyed. Hence, the name is more important than the form. In fact, Swami goes on to say, the, the name is like the currency. It is the money which actually buys you the form. Right? So, uh, then that's the, that, you know, that's the other thing that Swami talks about, Namaskarana. Then once again, Swami compares Namaskarana to all the other uh, sadhanas. He says, uh, in all, you, you know, you take up any other kind of sadhanas, there may be chances of you getting some so-called intermediate powers, you know. Like you see a lot of people who can read your mind, you know, they'll have these occult powers. These occult powers, they have a problem. They have a problem of actually destabilizing your entire, you know, spiritual sadhana. They can actually take you away. They can derail your spiritual progress. Whereas Namaskarana has no such a kind of you know intermediate derailment. There are no intermediate station. It is from beginning to end direct, you know, a non-stop flight. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, and then Swami also says two very important things is once you catch hold of, once you get hold of one name and one form, hold on only to that. Don't keep changing your names and forms because that also does not help you. Right? So uh, that is one thing very, very important, a very important, uh, you know, kind of a, 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 a caution that Swami is giving. And also, do not discuss with everybody what, your, what spiritual sadhana you are doing. Because somebody may just, you know, somebody who is very good at talking may just talk you out of whatever you are doing. They may shake your faith. They may shake your dedication and your determination. So don't allow that to happen. Be quiet. You know, it's a very, very personal progress that you're doing. So those are the two important things that Swami talks about. Finally, we will come to chapter number nine. Of course, in the chapter number nine, um, the most important are the first points that Swami talks about the development, the three stages of development. Okay. One is the lack of clarity, the stage. We all start with a sense of, you know, uh, confusion or lack of clarity. From there, we have to move to a stage of activity. So from lack of clarity to activity, and from activity, we get clarity. So Swami once again compares this to tamasic, rajasic, and sattvic. The whole idea of meditation or any other spiritual sadhana is only to move from tamasic to go to sattvic. Okay? Sattvic is the state of serenity. It is a state of prashanti. It is the state of satisfaction. It is the supreme state. It is the state where you are at absolute ease with yourself. So that is why it is called Uttama. So the word Swami uses is it is the Uttama Stiti. It is the highest possible stage. Most of us, we will get, you know, to move from a lack of clarity to activity is an extremely natural state. Automatically, most of us will move from, from you know, uh, from lack of clarity to some kind of activity. Where we have to put maximum effort is to actually move from activity to this highest stage of sattva. 
so for this the probably the most important sadhana is japat sahit dhyana okay japa sahit dhyana that is even before we get into meditation we chant the name of the lord first aloud or namasmarana right and then slowly let the let the name go in inward and then you focus on the name and let the name echo in your mind as your mind is focused on the form what what will happen is eventually even the form will dissolve and only the name will remain okay and here swami gives us some very very beautiful insight some tips he says if the mind is wandering let it wander don't worry about it okay you don't follow the mind okay you don't follow the mind just the mind is like a horse you know or it is like a dog or a cat it will go it will find for some time then it will come back okay what we do is we try we try to follow the mind and that is where we lose that path so i will end it here we will do a very quick exercise right now for all of you we will experience this dhyana okay we will experience the power of this dhyana okay so all of you um sit relaxed sit straight if possible straight sitting is very very important okay be relaxed you can gently close your eyes and simply listen to the instructions that are coming from here complete focus on the instructions that are coming in the beginning focus on your breathing your breathing in your breathing out breathe in breathe out feel the air going in through your nostrils and coming out from your nostrils feel the air filling your lungs feel the air being emptied out of your lungs relax every part of your body your eyes relax release the tension that is there on your facial muscles let all the muscles of your face relax just let go your shoulders relax your arms relax let the breathing be regular and steady your legs relax your back relax
your entire body is relaxed. Breathe normally. Now, simply listen to all the sounds that are surrounding you. Listen carefully. Don't examine it. Don't analyze the sound. Simply Listen to the sound. Your mind is relaxed and your ears are alert. If there is a fan in your room, you are listening to the blades of the fan going round and round. Listen to all the sounds that are emerging around you. Just listen. Just Listen. Breathe normally. Listen carefully. Do not allow the mind to follow the sounds. Just listen to the sounds. Now, gently bring your mind back to yourself and focus on the breathing. And now you may open your eyes. So we will end this session here and I would love to hear your thoughts. Do you have any thoughts at this point of time? You can put it in the chat box. Do you have any thoughts?
Sairam, brother, I have a question. Yes, Sairam, sister, please go ahead. Uh, Sairam, uh, so you were saying that we were, when we are imagining Swami's form, so if it is like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, so we in Puttapati, we would have seen Swami walking from there and sitting in the thorn and all these things. So if we are imagining the form and thinking about Swami, is this also a meditation? Yes, as long as the mind is completely focused on that form. Okay. Right? So if it is going to think now, which which is the color of the throne? Okay, is he going to sit from left side or right side, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, then that is not. Yeah. So I can see that most of you are saying extremely relaxed, right? Ah, now somebody has uh, written here. Almost, I nearly fell asleep. Now, this is exactly the point that Swami is making. See, from Ekagrata, no, it very easily falls into Shunyata. This falling asleep is Shunyata. Remember, that is Tamasik. The idea is not to fall asleep, but to actually be alert. Okay. Yes, somebody is writing uh, while listening to the sounds. I could imagine where it comes from, what that person is doing. Okay. Yes. So that's why I said, do not analyze from where it is coming, who is coming, why is that sound coming? See, that is how the mind keeps wandering away. Okay. Therefore, the instruction was just listen. Don't label it. Just listen. Okay. So how to keep mind steady while meditating? This is exactly what we did. So the whole idea is that is why sometimes guided meditation helps a lot because we are not used to talking to ourselves or our mind does not listen to our own voice. That is why guided meditation can help you. So when you're just listening, no, listen attentively. Yes, I get a vibration in the whole body when I get into concentration mode. Is that fine? It's good. It's good. In fact, you can start, you know, actually feeling the beating of your heart. And you can even start feeling your own pulse when you're in absolute concentration. Only thing is, once again, no, don't start labeling that. Is my heart beating too fast? Is it beating too slow? Is my pulse okay? Do I have blood pressure? <laughs> right? The mind will start going off in all of those directions. Don't do that. Just enjoy that. Right? Now, the question that I want to ask you, you know, is in that moment when we were doing this for about five minutes when we were doing it, were there any problems in that five minutes? Right? I'm sure you'll agree there were absolutely no problems. Right? See, that is the state of Prashanti. In fact, this is just a glimpse of what Prashanti is. Prashanti meaning not Prashanti Nilayam, okay? The Prashanti in your hearts, in your minds. See, why Swami is saying that in every one of our hearts, there is a Prashanti? Is because you can experience it right now. Right? In this little five minutes of uh, uh, demonstration. Believe me, this is not even meditation. This was just silent sitting. Okay? Just through the silent sitting, you are able to get a glimpse of what that ultimate peace could be like. Right. So I think some uh, participants have raised their hands. Uh, sister, yeah, I will. Yeah. I will ask uh, you to moderate. Yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. In chapter nine, actually, there was a, 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 a small paragraph about uh, swimming the river against the current. Right. Can you please explain that. Yeah, okay. Uh, we, let's go there. Let's go to the chapter number nine. And uh, okay, uh, do you do you have it in front of you, open in front of you? Yeah, I have. Yeah, can you read out that part that you're... Yeah, so I have it in open in front of me. In the intermediate stage, one will have certain natural propensities and tendencies that are not desirable, right? As long as one has these, one cannot surrender oneself to the Lord, Shiva. These tendencies have to be uprooted completely 
or at least have to be systematically endeavored to get rid of them such aspirants will have to be swimming against the current which is vyatireka pravaha gati that is what swami is saying so you see now the tendency of the mind you know is to always go in a uh, you know as it is trained by its vasanas okay once again these will be technical words for many people vasanas are nothing but impressions that we have been carrying in our mind from several janmas right so through all our previous births we are all the impressions of whatever we have been through we are bringing it now here so that is the natural direction in which the mind will tend to move we will have to take that mind and we will have to train it to move in another direction okay for example just like when you construct a dam no you have to actually change the entire course of the river right that is that is actually vyatireka pravaha gati isn't it you are changing the course of the entire river it requires tremendous amount of effort for a particular amount of time right it's not that for the next rest of your life you have to keep no only for only for a particular period of time in the beginning you have to put in that effort to change the direction of how the mind is going that is moving against the current okay for example look at an elephant i think this is also an example that we took up in our uh, orientation the mind is like an elephant it's like a wild elephant swami gives the example of a horse right in in chapter number 7 uh, or 8 the horse will all the time be running okay our job is to keep the reins in our hand slowly but steadily you know the the horse gives up its running and it starts listening to the instructor that is moving against the current if you were to leave us a horse on its by its own it will keep running all over the place it will do whatever it wants but if you want the horse to listen to the instructor you will have to train it you will have to tame it and then train it that is going against the current so that is what swami is talking about over here right thank you sai ram prata yes, uh, it sir. was indeed an astounding and fruitful session so now let's open the session for q and a Uh, we take a few questions from the participants. Uh, participants can either use the gesture option and raise their hand for Q and A, or put their question in the chat box. Yeah, E K A S F zero eight thousand. Can you please unmute and ask a question? Uh, Sai Ram, brother, it was a very uh, informative and relaxing uh, session. Thank you. And uh, I have a question regarding Nama Smarana or Japam. Uh, Swami constantly or repeatedly emphasize on the import importance of Nama Smarana. So there are certain uh, sometimes where Swami says while you are chanting the name of God, be it loudly or in your mind, or even Likita Japam, that you have to uh, imagine uh, the form of God and you have to have love and fondness towards that name. So uh, suppose say we are sitting for some time in front of the altar and uh, say we are chanting loudly or in my mind, in our mind, we have, will have that concentration and we'll be like okay we imagine the form. but sometimes when we are doing doing the daily chores let's say we are going for a walk and then in our mind we keep on repeating the name of god uh, will it be still considered i mean it will be mostly mechanical will it be still considered namasmaranam or japa so if you are going to see uh, training the mind you know has two aspects one is that we we start even start the particular thing even mechanically right so what we need to do is to develop a discipline of chanting the name at a particular time so one is yeah one is to keep chanting you know just to om shri sai ram om shri sai whatever ram ram or whatever you want to do do it but you have to now train your mind to sit in a particular place see what is now happening is when you go for a walk the idea is that i am getting my body to have some exercise ha huh, in the meantime i will do some namasmarana now flip that around which is find the time and space to do this namasmarana specifically for its own sake right that is what will train the mind so both you must start with definitely chanting the name whenever you can but do also train your mind that hey at this point of time i will chant only the lord's name and nothing else 
Okay, so uh, though it will be mechanical, it's good, but that mechanicalness also has to keep improving, right? Otherwise, it just becomes uh, another world. Uh, it does it. It will not have the kind of impact that you are thinking it should have. Okay, so in order to get the actual impact of that, you should find the time and a space, uh, you know, and actually discipline your mind to do that. See, that is why. we have weekly bhajans or daily bhajans or you know our morning uh, uh, you know time in the altar our evening time in the altar all of these traditions and customs is only so that you develop that discipline for the mind so uh, i hope that actually helps you thank you brother sairam 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 uh, next Aragram uh, Prabhu, TNS M sixteen. Can you unmute and ask question, Sairam? Uh, Sairam sir, uh, I have a question, a doubt on one of the questions. We have daily question answers on Dhyana Vahini. There was one question that, which said, "We should not treat those who are not even aware of Lord as our friends." This is a true or false question, and the answer, the correct answer, seems to be true. I am not able to, you know, understand this properly as it seems. Kind of, you know, labeling on a person or kind of contradicting to uh, love also. Uh, can you please explain this? Yeah. So that is this. This is from um, this is from a particular uh, chapter that Swami talks about. Is that when it comes to um, when it comes to training your mind, you no. Know, it is very important that all the inputs which are going to your mind are pure. if you are going to get contrary kind of impressions or inputs on your mind it will just not help you to settle down anywhere right so it is only to uh, regulate the inputs that are coming into your mind that certain statements like don't you know don't go and mix around with anybody and everybody we are not trying to label them but for example just imagine no you go and you have you know like a um, a banter let's say you know you just go have coffee or something with your friends and the entire discussion is on how crooked a particular person is or you know what's happening in office and who is doing what and what is the politics and the gossip behind you know that fellow did this and this guy is doing this now can you tell me can you actually do meditation after that or can you come back and contemplate straight away right the mind keeps on running because it will be following a particular lead why you know x y and z right what swami is saying is that try to stop all of those inputs okay any any of those inputs it could even mean uh, you know it could even mean for example uh, uh, going to uh, going to study circle and discussing all sorts of things okay so we are not labeling the person we are labeling the impression that it is creating on our mind now there we have to be very clear about what is an impression which is beneficial to me versus what is a impression which is not beneficial to me right so it is about uh, labeling the impression of the mind not people thank you sir thank you sir sairam uh, next uh, doni doni parti venkata please unmute and ask question sairam sir thank you very much for wonderful session i have actually two questions one is uh, i have seen swami's video where swami is telling uh, soham during the meditation so uh, i want to know what is the meaning of that uh, word soham so soham is nothing but sah means he aham means i so i'm simply saying i am he or i am it so basically we are not it's just a constant reminder that i am god i am god i am god and soham is nothing but you know if you look at uh, how our when we uh, when we take in our breath Right, what's happening? It is so. So our breath, which is going inward, is so. And when we are leaving it out, it is. Hmm, right. So, uh, what is actually happening is unconsciously. Okay, twenty six thousand, twenty one thousand six hundred times. That is the average number of breaths that we take in a day. Okay, twenty one thousand six hundred times. I am telling myself, I am God. okay so even if you are not able to do anything right even if you have a few minutes every now and then even in the middle of work believe me right bang in the middle of a really important work you can simply take a break right there's a strategic time out in ipl no 
strategic time out <laughs> okay take that strategic time out use these strategic time outs even in the middle of your work just take a time out okay and then you know what to do go back and and just be pay attention to what is already happening you don't have to put in any effort the effort is automatic what is the body saying so hum just pay attention no need of any other mantra no need of any other name and form just pay attention you know this is what is this soham called it is called ajapa gayatri okay this is a gayatri which is going on without you having doing any japa a japa there is no need to put in any effort to do this japa because it's constantly going on on its own so this is soham sir my other question is like swami's message is like lawal and sarwal the first thing love wall is like uh, like looking at the life at stage and loving all like uh, like we cannot keep emotions on one side and we cannot no, love don't okay so so here is my uh, <laughs> my response to that no don't bother about love all serve all there is another uh, phrase that swami says help ever hurt never okay so i i my my uh, my formula is love all serve all help ever hurt never no start from ulta okay start from first hurt never is that doable yes ah once you start hurting never no automatically it is helping ever because in most cases no the biggest help that we can do to anyone is not to hurt them <laughs> okay so hurt never including hurting yourself huh? do not hurt yourself also self hurt is the biggest kind of hurt that you can do so hurt never including myself which is the biggest help ever help ever is nothing but serving all and serving all is nothing but loving all you cannot serve all without loving all so love all is the actually the outcome of serving all and helping ever so when you hurt never you will automatically reach love all okay this is my a short answer to you <laughs> thank you very much sairam sir Sairam, those participants who want to ask a question can please raise your hand. Okay, next, Sister Sharvari Kulkarni, can you please unmute and ask a question? Sairam, brother. Sairam, uh, brother, Swami has been uh, emphasizing on three gunas: Sattva guna, Rajo guna, and Tamo guna. Uh, Swami has been telling that we have to um, uh, increase our Sattva guna, Sattva. Uh, so uh, does it mean that uh, rajo guna and tamo guna has to be totally discarded or it should be um, uh, those should be absent totally or how we should understand so, yeah. this so, question brother so there are there are two understandings of this sattva rajas and tamas okay one is sattva rajas and tamas as the building blocks of the universe okay so we will not go into that uh, I, i probably i simply stirred the hornet's nest by introducing this concept of sattva rajas and tamas i just felt it is important because in some cases you will start um, you will actually read about sattva rajas and tamas as the building blocks of the universe okay so don't worry about that part what what swami is mentioning over here to us is in our individual lives tamas is nothing but inertia okay tamas is nothing but um you know kind of dullness okay uh, dullness of the mind um dullness of the body so laziness uh, postponing procrastination all of that no is absolutely not helpful in any world in spiritual world or in material world correct so definitely eschew tamas so the strategy that swami gives for tamas is eschew it eradicate it get rid of it throw it out of your system be active now you may say some amount of you know like tamas is important like deep sleep deep sleep is the uh, is the part that i mentioned you know that it is a part of nature itself so that is not bad you need to sleep well right you need some amount of uh, what should i say tamas to make your sattva and rajas more uh, active in the sense right so you need your 8 hours of sleep but the idea is not to sleep right the purpose is not to sleep the purpose is to move towards sattva so here tamas is also useful for sattva okay so first of all when it comes to dullness when it comes to laziness give it up 
okay rajas rajas is activity now this rajas as an activity no will always make us focus on the results of the activity that is where the problem starts activity per se is not bad at all right we have, we must be active but the problem with rajas is that when we when we, if we start focusing too much on the result of the activity and then if you don't get the results that we want then we gets disappointed then you know what it happens we start moving towards uh, tamas oh main kyun karu yaar kuch nahi ho raha yaar you know nothing is happening no need to do this how much ever i do it is always less only so let me not do it this giving up so you see rajas with a focus on the fruit of the activity takes us towards tamas whereas rajas with the only idea that you know what i am doing it for the sake of its own doing like doing duty or doing my responsibility will start taking us towards sattva okay and sattva is that uh, stage of mind where we are absolutely at peace with whatever we do see often times you no know, uh, in at work or at home you would have put in your best effort okay and but the person who is receiving whatever work you are doing they may not take it in the same way for example in spite in spite of you doing your best your boss comes and shouts at you or somebody at home is disappointed with the way you are doing things you know what you will take it but internally you know you know hey you know what you have done your best this is swami this is the best i could do or to you know you you will say you will tell yourself that is the level of sattva now uh, the the problem with sattva is that one must not feel that oh so basically whatever i do i should be satisfied with no rajas and sattva no they play like a one pushes the other rajas will make you get better and better and better at whatever you are doing okay and sattva is that irrespective of whatever you do you are at peace okay so it's like a what should i say it's like a, a self feeding loop it's a self feeding loop that's uh, uh, rajas should take you towards sattva S- sattva will help you to do rajas better and slowly but surely you will reach a stage which is pure sattva which is like what all the self realized souls do the pure mahatmas no for example bhagwan or ramana maharshi or ramakrishna right or jesus christ right? all of these were at pure sattva so does it mean that they did not do any work in fact they did the maximum amount of work right but they were always in pure sattva so that is what it means so the the, the strategies are eschu eschu tamas that is eradicate tamas transform rajas and uh, and manifest sattva so transform rajas into sattva these are the three strategies eradicate transform manifest thank you sir uh, so i think the question was how long do we go um how long can we go for q and a i think we can take maybe one more question and then we'll wrap up maybe one or two questions okay, okay brother next uh, sister shraddha nair can you please unmute and ask a question thank you sir thank you for the wonderful session uh, my doubt is uh, stony talks about uh, the manas and the buddhi as the, the two bullocks which are carrying us across which is which are carrying our cart uh, mm-hmm. so my yes. i wanted to understand uh, is the manas the same that we carry across lives and is the buddhi do we carry the same buddhi and the manas across lives or do we get a fresh manas and fresh fresh pair of manas and buddhi in every life and we have to start from scratch in training them okay so for this um, uh, you will have to join another course <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, since there is a sister uh, um, our sister vishalakshi is there on this uh, call and she has done another course called adhyatma vidya and in that we actually discuss this at length right so now you are what you are asking is about antah karana okay um yes sister anubhuti is also there so i think she she has also gone through this so this is exactly i think any of these sisters will be able to answer your question very clearly it is only the chitta that we take from life to life so antah karana our mind you no know, is actually has four aspects manas buddhi chitta and ahankara okay i won't be able to go into details of each of these but very simply manas is nothing but thoughts sankalpa and vikalpa right 
if you understand a little bit of uh, hindi or even sanskrit a uh, sankalpa and vikalpa the mind has only one property the manas part of it which is having thoughts having and having counter thoughts so sankalpa and vikalpa manas second is buddhi which is uh, the the discriminative faculty of the mind the faculty which tells us okay do this or do this for example let's take a quick example i think an example will help you uh, you met somebody yesterday okay so you had a conversation with them now today you meet the same person okay what is happening the moment you see that person a set of thoughts are emanating correct right now from where are they emanating they are emanating from the last the last interaction that you had with them okay which was yesterday's interaction all of this yesterday's interactions have gone and formed impressions in what is called chitta chitta is the water tank okay in which all impressions not only from this birth but all the previous births impressions are there okay now the moment you look at that person if you have had a bad experience with that person what is happening okay you say are yaar aa gaya wo wapas you know that idiot right why because the impression has already been formed now the thought is from the manas the thought is coming that fellow is a fool or that person is coming to have an argument with me once again okay at this point of time the buddhi comes and tells you hey either run away from that place or take him head on right there is a decision making faculty of the mind right which tells you know what i don't want to talk to that guy or i want to talk to that guy i need to give him a piece of my mind right both of these this is the faculty of buddhi the buddhi is telling you do this or do this okay and the last which is ahankara is all of this whether it's the chitta or whether it's the buddhi or whether it is the manas no all of this are who's they are mine they are the shraddha nayar's thoughts they are shraddha nayar's uh, actions decisions and they are shraddha nayar's impressions so impressions thoughts and decisions these are all mine this aspect of the mind which actually appropriates all of this to oneself is ahankara this is how the mind works thank you sir sairam brother i will take one more question uh, from sister jayashri rc jayashri can you please unmute and ask the question sairam uh, sairam sir sairam sairam i want to ask one question uh, you had told uh, about that uh, acting on the stage i didn't uh, tell sir. swami told <laughs> ah, yes sir i know thing was swami told we were discussing about that so i was just i was asking uh in the in the fact you were telling that uh, acting so we have to think that the person who is coming to us he is also acting so in that time just i want to get one idea if a person who is coming in front of us and he is uh, stalking which we are not expecting like uh, something uh, which we don't expect from him so that time uh, that time we can't uh, we can't expect from that na so what, how to, how to um, um face that problem i don't know that's why i just asked okay uh, now you are taking it way too literally okay however let me try and uh, give you some uh, other thing so if it is something that you are not expecting and it is bad okay then you try and see whether is there something beneficial to you out of that for example let me give you my own example okay now let us say uh, a very very uh, common example i have sung a bhajan i think i have sung it very well somebody comes and tells me somebody whom i don't even know right some stranger comes and tells me ki today you know that one bhajan that is my bhajan only which i would have sung somebody comes and tells me that bhajan was terrible sairam brother please you know i don't know who sang it but that bhajan was terrible it was not sung well at all okay now i am not expecting it okay i am expecting people will come and of course i don't expect anything now but i'm saying i was not expecting somebody will come and tell me that the bhajan was bad now if i were to look at this as an entire stage and each is an actor you know how i will you know what will be my thought process 
my thought process will be swami the director wanted to convey something to me which i did not understand means i was not paying attention to the director so the director has now given a dialogue to another person to come and tell me directly to my face okay that hey you know what i am not happy with your bhajan so now i am converting this critique into something that is beneficial to me which is to listen to the voice of my own conscience however let's let's take another example where uh, somebody comes and unreasonably comes and tells me something you know which which i do not want to hear i have a simple uh, you know what i can think about it is swami there is something the director and now i'm thinking about the director director there is something that you want to convey out of me i am not able to understand it now because of my inability to understand it i would only pray to you that you give me a better understanding of you know whatever is going on so try to convert everything into something which is uh, you know a positive reinforcement for you the way i look at it no is gamify your life okay every day is a game okay see what swami uh, you know what swami is trying to tell you what games swami is trying to play with you okay the more and more you try to understand that no you'll be like ah swami i got it today i got it this is what you wanted to tell me right then you know what happens the message becomes important the messenger does not become important often times you know we confuse the message and the messenger right we shoot the messenger for the message it is the message which is important not the messenger so keep this in mind that everybody is simply merely playing a role and the message is coming from the director not from the actor this would be my simple answer short answer okay thank you thank you saina so thank you saina tata um i think we will wrap up um we okay there somebody is asking for a bhajan i have just spoken for one and a half hours <laughs> and my my voice is probably not as as good um as uh, as it should be and uh, in fact after this i have to go for my aradhana day practice uh, so i'm heading out for the practice uh, you know for tomorrow evening's program so if you don't mind um, we will end over here maybe we will sing a short bhajan so that we will end this on the name uh, the name of the lord okay so let's sing something which is हे श्याम सुंदरा हे साई सुंदरा परती पुरीश्वरा हे साई सुंदरा हे श्याम सुंदरा हे साई सुंदरा नील मेघ सुंदरा नीरजलोचना ब्रह्मांडन का हे साई सुंदरा ब्रह्मा ब्रह्मांडनाय का हे साई सुंदरा हे श्याम sundara he sa sundara i wish you all a very 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 prosperous and happy akshay tritiya and also eid mubarak to each and every one of you you know the beautiful lesson that we learn from this wonderful festival of ramzan is just imagine for 30 days not a single you know a particle of food is eaten 
by all our Muslim brothers and sisters. It's a great example in discipline of the mind. Right? Today, it is the culmination of that. So, we also uh, wish you all a very, um, uh, you know, very holy Eid Mubarak, a happy Akshay Tritiya. And day after tomorrow, we are all going to observe the Aradhana day. It's a wonderful day to start our contemplation on that Sakara Swarupa who went into Nirakara Swarupa on this day, 12 years back. So with that, I end. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I hope it has benefited you. Wishing you all the best for the rest of the program. Sairam to all of you. Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Bhagwan Shri Satya Sai Baba Ji Ki